Territorial. Every morning a boy walks by my house. The neighbor's dog barks, and this boy barks back, which drives the dog crazy. I imagine it standing on its hind legs at the window, startled by the audacity, the new world accent, the lack of proper credentials. The dog barks, and its teeth snap, saliva drools, its collar cinches. The boy digs into his bark to where sound is darker. He blows out his name and becomes, for a moment, a voice rising to meet another threatened voice. Then he goes to school. And this is how a friendship begins. The dog, for the rest of the morning, circles its pillow, adjusts the blanket, and pulls the rubber octopus from under the couch. It does its work, patrolling the forest of chair legs, trolling beneath the cabinets, a sentry up the stairs, then back down. Trouble simmers far off on the city's back burner. It scratches behind its ear fervently. It cleans between its nails. Once in a while, it woofs at something indiscernible. It growls, waiting. When it sleeps, the boy climbs into its dreams and tries to steal its ball, but the dog is mightier and its kingdom of balls remains intact. Down the street, the boy at school runs ferociously, his wide arms plow the wind out of his way. At recess, he is starving and bites the head off his granola bar. When he sits to spell his words, his legs move as if he's dreaming of running or being chased. Courage. The seniors bring heavy spoons to their lips. They have committees for setting the tables, for carrying the bowls. They sit next to each other and wonder about snow removal, their winter coats lining the hallway, hunkered like husks. My mother doesn't drink, but to give this speech has downed a shot of vodka. Muriel is in charge of many things, she begins. You'd think at this age they'd notice the hive of souls they're sitting in, the rasp of wings, the fingers not prying but recollecting by touch. Muriel bristles and sits up. The restaurant for the Christmas party has not been reserved yet, and vodka is the pirate taking over my mother's voice. Courage. She is standing at the helm of the luncheon about to announce mutiny. Who can blame her? Everything that dies in this small town flies its way to these gatherings, the hollowed names of husbands and their resurrected cardigans, the pilgrimages their wives make to the kitchen in the long mirage of mourning. In this leftover light, Muriel stands up. She has things under control, she tells them. And the ghosts of the bossy girls face one another, faded and fragile boned. They've become sisters in the back seat of the long drive. They may as well be fighting over the window, the clear view of fields giving over to sky, as long as they don't look up, as long as they keep each other occupied until they get there. In this way, they're saving themselves from the bother, the business of being afraid, and from the last bewilderment they'll feel when they finally do arrive at whatever comes after. The Canadian Apology We're sorry, we're so sorry, but we are sorry. It's a Canadian thing like Torts here or Irving. Picture a moose trudging through tundra towards another moose, Antlers grazing maple trees that haven't been cut down yet. The snort of exertion, the clomp of intent. That's us trying to find each other in this wilderness so we can apologize for something. Standing too close, standing too far, being hard to find in the appointment thicket of our days. We're sorry one of us invented frozen fish fillets because single portion frozen dinners invented a new loneliness. And the lonely bone, they say, is connected to the drinking bone. The rest, well, the rest is history. Our apologies are welcome mats and engagement rings, the tiebreaker in overtime, Pierre Burton's bow ties, meaningful. We take an eternity to back into a parking spot and then feel sorry for all the unparked cars still circling. We're even sorry for feeling a little lucky. And though having a pocket full of loonies is a good thing here, it sounds like something we should apologize for. We roll up the rim to win at the same place we see Jesus miraged on the wall beside the drive-thru window. 
We are sorry, though, for our A's, our toques, about a boot. We're sorry for the Putsin, but not for our beer or Leonard Cohen. We tap our trees and drink from them. We understand then what it's like to blossom, though we don't speak of this. The sky is such a choir here. We're sorry how scared we get when our love sees its own shadow, how we disappear for a long season. We wish we could, but often we can't. Desolé, desolé, we try. Our apologies are foghorns in the great sea of social gatherings where we pass each other like tankers gliding by the shore of an all-you-can-eat buffet. I am truly sorry for that last line. The poet John Thompson said we are brave at our kitchen tables, brave in our beds, but cowards under the moon. We are sorry for that as well. The moon has a way of calling us out from our homes, and we stand beneath its whiteness, stripped of nerve. The trees are an endangered silence then, witnessing. Winter is a mystery. The night breathes us in and waits for what we have to say for ourselves. The shift must happen now. Transformation, our apologies braver, migrating into the realm of reprieve when we hear ourselves say, forgive us, and then, what can we do? Sacrifice. The light of the moon ricochets off the bulrushes and projects itself into a moose. Your foot on the brake is doing mouth to mouth. Come on. The minute is overweight and sweaty. All you see is a wonderment of nonchalance. This beast has swallowed the woods and is transporting them across the highway. You hunch, convinced you could drive under it. You hunch because you're facing something both horny and holy. Doesn't everything important start with that same impulse? Your heart in the passenger seat needs its asthma pump. Have you seen its asthma pump? Your heart in the booster seat kicks the back of your seat. Are we there yet? The night is looking out the window at its own reflection. You call out to your angels. You pray for giant cartoon hands to pull this moment from its bones. This is how you were raised. Desperate. You are not in good shape. And now you are skidding. Up close, the moose is an elegance of scraggle, and you succumb to die with this new idea of beauty. The car is a curtsy before everything wild on a trespass of highway, and you are the chosen apology. Your hands loosen. When you look back up to it, it's no longer there. And days later, was it ever? This last lamp. Do not be deceived. This last lamp does not give more light. The dark has only become more absorbed in itself. Paul Salan. Like the deer running erratic in the mall, the dark is out of breath. It's not that you're chasing it, more like holding up torches and threatening to. It's good weather for a witch hunt, and you don't trust it, do you? This last lamp is held up to examine the dark tongue of animal. What has it eaten, and how does it talk? This last lamp is a miner down the long throat of midnight. Your father sits with his thermos, his legs not being what they used to be. Go on without me, he says, and you do. What choice do you have but to strike his gentle words like a match? The only thing that burns is the lonely hour without him. Ah, grown up. How do you tell the time? There is a wolf in your memory. When you wake, you see it running with something in its mouth. Save the children, your wife screams, and you get out of bed and start the car before realizing it was only a dream. The children are long gone, the stilt of their shadows, a high-rise towering over the rural plot you've become. You, a scruff, scruff of ragweed and thistle. Remember your plans? and the candle you called yourself? Resist. There is no camp, no ashes to shift. The patios are empty save the barbecues. More than a minute online is dangerous, especially if you've been drinking. Obsessive whistling has got to stop. There is no longer any theme song. Everything is 90% advertisement patrolled by an army of shopping hours. 
stay off the paths, eat less, carry more. The young ones bearing weapons will want to name the animals, dissuade them. If you are to count the cows, count also the plates. Steam rumors open and eat the nut at their core. Leave the gossip to the rivers. Photographs will be buried at the base of diseased trees. All eyes are distractible. Smiles are especially alluring. The sump pump can't get rid of the water. And God, I am told, is a canoe-shaped hole in all of us. Books, those old grandmothers, are losing their teeth. Stay focused. Those aren't stars. They're flashlights. Add. Don't divide. Love best those who have forgotten how. There are no favorites in this dark. Now scatter.